Grace and peace. I'm Brian Musser, the Baptist Campus Minister at Drexel University, and this is Peace and Power Christian Fellowship, the peace of Jesus Christ to change your life, the power of the Holy Spirit to change the world. And we are continuing our journey through the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5 through 7. We are in the last half of Matthew chapter 5. We're talking about this, this series of six um, places where Jesus says, I, you have heard it said to those of old something, but I tell you. And these are illustrations of the idea of what it means for Jesus to fulfill the law and the prophets and what it means to have righteousness that surpasses the Pharisees and scribes. Both ideas that were we saw in Matthew 5, 17 through 20. Um, in the previous lesson. In the first video of this lesson, we talked about how Jesus is going to use some of these bold statements that this is a sermon and that there is one main idea through this entire sermon. And we're going to look at that main idea. We're going to look at the first four illustrations of that idea um, in this video and then come to the last two illustrations in the third video. So this is the second video of lesson four. It's talking about getting to the heart and the overarching idea of this section is the heart of the law. But let's look at this first illustration. Matthew 5, 21 through 26. You heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, Leave your gift there before the altar and go. First, be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you'll be put in prison. Truly, I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. So this is the first example. It's, you have heard it said, do not murder. But I tell you, anyone who, um, anyone who even calls their brother a fool is subject to the hell of fire, which is this idea that is not just what's going on, not just whether or not you murder somebody, but has a lot to do with what's going on inside of your heart. Some basic points to this, and. It's still breaking the law that if you hate your brother, even if you do not follow through with the action of murder. And in a kind of a sidebar there, it is impossible to properly worship God or love God if you are at odds with your brother. So what was going on was the Pharisees were teaching that you should not kill, which is perfectly fine, connects with the law of Moses. But Jesus is like, yes, you should not kill. That, that's true. But it isn't just about the not doing the action of killing. The law, yes, there was a legal ramifications for not killing folks. But it also is supposed to point to the heart. The law was supposed to point to the heart. And whether or not you were angry enough with your brother to kill them, or just angry enough with them to disrespect them by calling them a fool or cursing at them or something like that. Like, like it's not just your actions, but it's the heart that leads to those actions. And if you're worshiping God with your heart, if your heart is what is important, then that heart that is sullied by anger and hatred toward your brother will also have trouble worship, truly worshiping God. So not just what you do, but what's going on in your heart is kind of the main point of this passage. And we'll see that come up time and time again in each of these six illustrations. It's not just the action, 
It's what's going on in the heart. Next illustration, Matthew 5, 27 through 30. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I said to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Quick kind of thought question here. What part of you causes you to commit the sin of adultery? If we think about it, and it's actually in the verse there, it's not our hands and it's not our eyes that causes us to, to commit adultery. So cutting off our hand won't stop us from committing adultery. Gouging out our eye won't stop us from committing adultery. What causes us to commit adultery? It's the lust that is in our heart. So obviously these statements about cutting off a hand, gouging out an eye, one, are exaggerated statements that are that are there to get people's attention, their rhetorical device to really be exaggerated so that people are actually listening to it, you know. But it's also kind of even more so is this idea that if adultery happens in the heart, in the will, then actually cutting out the heart and exchanging it for a new heart or as Ezekiel would say turning in a heart of stone for a heart of flesh a heart transplant or an exchange of the heart an exchange of the will a connecting the heart to the worship of God in a way that hasn't been done before is kind of what this is verse is hinting at Again, it is still breaking the law if you lust after a woman, even if you do not follow through with the action of adultery. If the sin of adultery is caused by our hearts, like murder, then cutting out our hearts of stone for our heart of flesh is the solution. Kind of Ezekiel 36 verses 26 through 27 hints at that. And that is kind of a, that's a Jewish idea. That's a Old Testament idea that Jesus could be hinting at that folks in the crowd would have picked up on that if adultery occurs in the heart, cutting off your hand won't do anything about it. But cutting out your heart and replacing it with a heart of flesh would, or as Jeremiah would say, having the Lord write the law of the Lord on your heart, it, it would, would do something about it as well. Looking at the next one, and we are flying through these just to because they're really teaching the same lesson. They're illustrations of the same point over and over again. Matthew 5, 31 through 32. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of adore, divorce. But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on grounds of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman, woman commits adultery. So, talking about divorce, there's this entire legal system set up for divorce in the Old Testament. And it does, basically, there are three sort of ideas with it. Mosaic Law did three things to regularize and control divorce. It limited it to certain conditions, required a formal bill of divorce, and made divorce permanently binding. You couldn't remarry somebody you divorced. Um, Matthew 19, 1 through 12 is a more extended version of how Jesus talks about this. Interestingly enough, Jesus gives the exception of divorce in the case of adultery is, is permissible. However, that wasn't the way the Old Testament went about it. If, if you were caught in adultery, you were stoned, not divorced. So, so it's interesting to see that the one exception that Jesus gives making divorce permissible is would have been punished by a different thing. It would have been punished by death and not divorce in the, the law of Moses. Now, 
there's a kind of an idea here and we hear this exception clause and we think well, what about other things would be divorce be permissible in say domestic abuse cases and that isn't necessarily what jesus is getting at here he's not talking about when and under what conditions divorce is permissible or not he's talking about the heart of the individual that makes us divorce somebody he's talking about this idea of what is going on inside of you in the case of divorce and this is and I know domestic abuse happens to men, but quite often it ha it's, it's, it happens more often to women. And at this moment, divorce was not something that a woman could initiate. So there wasn't a legal proceeding at this time for a woman to divorce a man because of domestic abuse. So that's not necessarily even something that this is talking about. And I may make a video later this week specifically talking about domestic abuse and divorce specifically talking about some of the ins and outs of this very sensitive topic but the idea isn't that again we're, jesus is not doing this to make up another 10 commandments to enforce sort of a rule he's using an illustration to bring back to the main point what does it look like for your righteousness to surpass that of the Pharisees and this interesting illustration the teaching this teaching about divorce points back to Jesus' statements about anger and lust the two previous illustrations which is a big reason for divorce and then also points forward to Jesus's comments about making an oath um, because a marriage commitment would be one of the most important oaths that we make and we can see in Matthew 19 8 Jesus directly connects the problem of the divorce to is an issue of a heart and with the issue of the hardness of heart and the idea is if you are selfish enough to divorce your wife except for the cases of infidelity on her part then it does not matter if you committed adultery or not your heart is wrong that's the main idea that's going on here is not jesus creating it legalistic parameters for when divorce is right and wrong it's this idea that if you're divorcing your wife you're probably doing it for selfish reasons and that's a hard issue especially at this time and place now the last of the examples we'll get to in this video is matthew 5 33 through 37 again you have heard that it was said to those of old you shall not swear falsely but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say simply yes, be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. So this idea of swearing oaths or swearing in such a way to make your words more believable I, I, obviously we're working through something different here and the idea is probably swore to the woman you're divorcing swearing to your brother swearing to all these things this is there was a complicated set of circumstances rules regulations to how someone swore but questions why do we swear or take oaths quite often we swear or take oaths because we want somebody to believe us when they don't already believe us and the interesting and this might be just something for you to think about are you more or less likely to believe someone who takes an oath who swears like on my mother's grave is something we talk about a lot well i'll swear over my dead body you know just some of these things that are you know we throw around in our culture and it's to make us more believable than we are in everyday life we swear and take oaths to encourage 
even coerce sometimes or manipulate others to believe us. Now, if we were believable, we would not need oaths to convince others of our truthfulness. These oaths were used to allow us to encourage others to believe us without the annoying inconvenience of living a trustworthy life. Honesty is a heart issue. Is it, and this is something that comes up in the discussion. Is it okay to take oaths in formal settings, i.e. courtrooms, public office, um, even in marriages? And Jesus is not creating a law here. Jesus is using this as an example to show how your heart has to be different and that of the Pharisees to have a righteousness that surpasses it, to fulfill the law and the prophets. The main idea, murder, adultery, divorce, and swearing false oaths are all outside symptoms of a deeper heart problem. That is kind of what Jesus is illustrating with these four things here. As always, there are three ways to join this week. We will not be in person, but on Zoom for the Sunday night one. Also live on Zoom for the Monday night ones. These weekly wrap-ups on YouTube and WordPress. I'm all over the social media, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, WordPress, YouTube. Those links are in the description below. Enjoyed having this conversation with you. Hope to wrap it up in the next video when we look at the final two illustrations Jesus makes illustrating this one idea that he's coming for.